So it's of course a great privilege for me uh, to moderate this roundtable, as I see among our panelists, uh, major contributors from the field of KPFM. So we have uh, three panelists from academia and two panelists, two industrial panelists from uh, representing NanoSurf and Zurich Instruments. And I think it, it creates a nice uh, mix between science and technology, especially in this field of KPFM that requires a lot of instrumentation and technical development. So it's great that we can address this with these experts. And so uh, let me just provide you with a short background for our five speakers, for those of you who joined us a little bit later. So Benjamin is a director of the Recherche NRS and work also at the CEA in Grenoble, applying a various KPFM technique. Yes, thank you for, for joining <clears throat> on polymer and solar cell and other material. So Sasha is a PI at the Nanostructured Solar Cell Group inside the Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory in Portugal with the goal to develop materials and devices for photovoltaic energy conversion. So Stefan is a junior university professor with his own group on advanced scanning force microscopy in Mainz, always aiming at the highest possible resolution. And, and this led him to new development technique, and especially in the field of KPFM and piezo response force microscopy, as he has already shown nicely in his talk this morning. So Tino is basically a colleague and a friend. So he's now team leader at Zurich Instrument and product owner of Lab One. So this great piece of software uh, that you see each time you use our instrument. So now you know uh, who, to, to, who to blame or to praise. So Tino did his PhD and postdoc in the, on KPFM, of course, in the group of uh, Andrea Stemmer. So another big shot of KPFM at ETH in Zurich. And that provides me with a nice, nice introduction for Dominic, who uh, basically did also his PhD in the same group at ETH. And I think there was some overlap with Tino as well, as he started um, earlier. And then he went to sunny California for a postdoc uh, and started his own company, Scuba Probe, before joining NanoSurf as CTO about a year from now. So before we start, uh, let's just mention how we will proceed. So we'll basically switch between three panelists. Yes, thank you for, for you can turn your camera on and I will also stop sharing so that we can uh, just have a nice chat together. So we will uh, try to, because time is limited, to answer up to five questions taken from the pool. And uh, we can of course also refer uh, to some of the results from the pool during your question. So, as I say, let me stop sharing. We can go into uh, gallery mode if you want to, or uh, to see everybody uh, speaking, uh, yeah. Okay, so let me start with the first question. Um, so with our in-house Kelvin probe and lab one expert, so Tino. So I have some hint what your favorite question is, but it's always know what the argumentation is behind. So uh, Tino, please. What is your favorite KPFM detection method? Yeah, Roma. first of all, uh, thanks a lot for having me. And thanks a lot for the kind introduction. Um, so, you know, I had this former life as a researcher at ETH. And uh, during this time, I, I, I got a strong preference for pulse gradient sensitive methods. Let's say it like this. So I, I sympathize a lot with uh, what uh, Stefan said this morning in his great talk uh, when he introduced all the methods. So thanks a lot for that. And my motivation for uh, KPFM in frequency modulation was very similar. So um, I was working on surface potential measurements for nanoelectronic devices. Um, so like nano wires or nano tubes. And in order to see the inter interesting uh, action uh, in the device, you need to be able to be uh, as sensitive to the local action on the tip apex. And this you only get if you're sensitive to the force gradient. Um, and especially on these devices, you have long range forces from electrodes or from gates. And if you want to get rid of that, you, you need to go for uh, frequency modulation. Um, so my devices were typically on the order of one micron or less. So down to let's say 15 uh, nanometers. Uh, so it's much smaller than the size of the cantilever. And for this reason, you want to get rid of these long range forces. And even amplitude, mod amplitude modulation, if you go for a single scan and are very close to the surface, 
it doesn't help much if you have uh, long uh, or large voltages applied to these electrodes of several volts and the action in the device is just a couple of uh, 100 millivolts or so. So it's important to be sensitive and accurate. So um, even though implementing frequency modulation methods is a lot more challenging and you need to use, you know, our instruments that we produce at Zurich Instruments and that we try to make as, as easy to use as possible. It's still a challenge to implement this in practice with existing um, existing hardware. Yeah. And I see that this is well in line with uh, the result from the pool as well. So it seems that uh, FM is... Uh, uh, is is uh, some of the favorite uh, um, technique from the audience. Maybe it was biased by the great talk from Stefan, who basically emphasized that point, which is of course obvious. But um, but I think uh, yeah, probably each technique has some pros and cons. And uh, yeah, maybe let's also discuss. Ask uh, Sasha. So what do you think about about this topic? Um, well, I mean, the, the arguments that we just heard, they are, of course, uh, quite valid, but, um, and, and this is specifically true if you, if you really work on, at the nanometer scale. Um, as I showed uh, in, in my presentation, I gave a hint already there, um, we are working with solar cell materials. So in, in solar cell material or in solar cells, normally a device is a square meter. <laughs> so um, obviously there's lots of interesting effects happening at the nanometer scale. This is why um, we saw a lot of interesting results this uh, with, with AFM and KPFM and other um, AFM methods. So um, our samples are actually quite rough. So um, I, I, I showed uh, before that Normally, we scan on a range of uh, a few micrometers square, and we have uh, height differences of a few hundred nanometers. And um, the grain size is typically uh, about a micrometer. So it, it's a good playground for, for Kelvin probe and, and AFM in general. Mm -hmm. um, but this these fairly rough samples make uh, life quite difficult when you scan just purely topography. So if, if you want to do uh, an, an FM uh, Kelvin probe mode, you need to go quite close. You have short range interaction and you need to be fairly close to the surface. And then um, either you scan extremely slow uh, so that the, the, the topography can still be clean, uh, which would increase your measurement time significantly, which is something that normally you don't want. Um, so therefore, um, we use the AM mode normally um, to, to be able to be a little bit further away from the surface. And we are talking a few nanometers, right? We, we are going, let's say, from, let's say, one, two nanometers to maybe five to 10 nanometers. It's still fairly close compared to, to lift mode um, in, in many mm -hmm. cases. Um, so, so, yeah, so basically for large surface inspection, uh, AM is basically more robust, more easily to operate, and, and at the end, so you can measure faster and get the things done quicker. Exactly, exactly. That's, yeah, a, can, that's indeed a good here. argument as well. So maybe so, let me ask again the same question to Benjamin, in case you have also a bit of a different view, or, or you want to, to comment on that? Uh, anyway, uh, so thank you very much, everybody. Mm. It's, it's indeed, as you can see, it's a bit difficult in a way to, 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 to give a, a, a reply. It depends on your requirements, the nature of your samples. So I completely agree, you know, with, uh, with Sasha. And I, I just uh, want to tell that in, in my own case, you know, I started um, uh, some more than 10 years ago. At the beginning, I was using amplitude modulations because it was easier for me to achieve the, a good signal to noise ratio. I was looking for very small, you know, uh, signal in terms of energy resolution. After, uh, I figured out, that, like many people, that in some cases, you know, I had some issue, you know, with uh, uh, the coastal artifacts, you know, with the topography. So I, I was no more confident in what, I, in what I, I was doing. So I, I turned to frequency modulation. But still, sometimes, you know, I, I had this issue uh, in a sense that uh, with frequency modulation, frequently, even uh, if sometimes this is not true, you need to push a bit more the AC modulation. To achieve the proper signal to noise ratio, and uh, I think that Stefan told this this morning. You know, uh, he had a good remark. You know, the frequency modulation that you use sometimes has hidden effects because you have the yeah. structural yeah. component of the electrostatic force that uh, we frequently forget, but unfortunately it's there, and uh, sometimes uh, you can have uh, artifacts induced by this uh, this static component on your measurement. The artifact 
this, this is also sometimes an issue, you know, when you perform the measurement under elimination, when you have changes in the capacitance of your sample, you mix up the effects. So I, I, I was a bit, you know, at some point, you know, um, I thought it was hopeless. And that's why I, I was really pleased uh, to try the uh, heterodyne mode because uh, it turns out that I, I was not sure it would work, you know, in, in my case, but uh, definitely it did. And uh, with the heterodyne, really, you mix the both of best worlds, uh, in my opinion, because you have definitely a very good energy resolution, similar to the one you can have with the amplitude modulation. But so far, I saw no cross-talk effect with the topography, and I got a very good, you know, topographic resolution. So uh, I think that for the community of UHG also, you know, not only for the, the it can, if I am right, huh, but I think from uh, anyway, the UHG community, for, from the group of uh, paper with the Japanese group, Gawara, and it was really used after by, by, by many people very nicely, like uh, Stefan, you know, with uh, uh, setups, you know, in inert conditions, or unknown conditions, but also for the UHG community, really, we shall consider that mode, which, which really now uh, opens some perspectives, you know, uh, because it, relatively simple to implement, even if you need a bit more, you know, of the tronics than the, uh, uh, than the basic amplitude modulation, but this is not that complicated anyway, and really you have some advantages. Yeah. My, my opinion. Yeah, this is a great answer as well. So I'm glad that everything was a bit balanced and put into perspective. I'm sure it would be great to get everybody speaking about this topic, and I think we could speak even longer. Uh, but um, yeah, let's also address other, other possible uh, issues and, and topic related to KPFM. So uh, now let's uh, move on to Stefan. So what is your favorite mechanical and electrical actuation scheme? Yeah, before I answer that question, I want to make a really short remark uh, about the previous topic. So we tried yeah. direct comparison AM second eigen mode and uh, uh, heterodyne KPFM on perovskite samples. And you see a huge contrast and the crane boundaries in AM mode, which disappears as soon as you use the FM mode. And there's so many papers out there that that interpret a hell lot of things into this grain boundary contrast. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks for the support. And um, yeah, that that is really an issue. Uh, so many groups just have uh, an AFM sitting around, uh, which which spits out KPFM images. This is something you really need to take into account that a grain boundary contrast might be an artifact. And yeah, so there's there's many many papers out there that that claim this stuff. But uh, we wanted to talk about mechanical. Yeah, and there will be a question about artifact as well. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, so it, it, it here I must uh, say clearly it depends. So um, piezo actuation has uh, some drawbacks. So these piezos have resonances themselves. It's usually not a clean drive, but for air, it's still um, it's still okay. So as soon as you go into uh, into liquid environments, then of course piezo is. Uh, so th the best option is uh, for me is photothermal drive. So uh, but for for ambient conditions. Um, so for those who don't know it, so photothermal drive means you need a modulated laser that heats up the backside of the cantilever and thereby you get uh, periodic stress. And so the, the, the cantilever starts to vibrate. This is the most direct way of uh, mechanically actuating the, the cantilever. And that gives you just basically the textbook uh, harmonic oscillator response that you would expect. But uh, usually for air, that's not necessary because the piezo drive is just as good so you don't add that many artifacts yeah and i think uh, dominic would also have some comment on photothermal because it's a, it's a new implementation now but um, but uh, in more generic terms so um, so do you have some preference also in terms let's say on simultaneous versus, versus sequential ex excitation um, yeah so i i think lift mode or dual pass techniques are kind of getting out of fashion because we can actually get much closer if you do the single scan. Um, but one thing that people often don't talk about is that the topography feedback needs to be really good. You want to be as close as possible to do KPFM, yeah. but Otherwise, you don't yeah. want to touch. So you want to be yeah. stay in the non-contact regime. And many beginners totally fail at this. Like the KPFM setting up is actually easier than to get a good uh, topography feedback, especially if you work in uh, ambient environment where you have a water film and it's difficult to get out of that water film. 
and also the interpretation of the results when you have a water film is very challenging. Um, but I find it interesting that when you do lift mode, you actually have no oscillation of the cantilever while you're over your surface. If a KPFM feedback is working in AM mode, your cantilever is not vibrating and you don't need to shake it because you just do an electrical actuation. And again, the KPFM feedback tries to keep the amplitude zero. That means you can actually go closer to the sample. Um, so you can use negative lift heights. It's a bit counterintuitive and it takes people some time to understand, but you have a tapping amplitude when you take the topography image and you can reduce your lift height by that tapping amplitude. So you can, can get really close to the sample without mechanically moving the cantilever. You're just hovering over the sample, actually trying- That's smart, but I guess that's because when you have a, a, a rather normal large tapping amplitude, right? Yeah, but I mean, yeah. this applies even if you have a few nanometers, you can try to get closer. It depends on, on your sample size and you know, how much your instrument drifts. That's also an important topic when you do dual pass because between two lines, you don't want your sample to move up and down. No, that's a great answer. And it's nice to put in a different perspective as well, because we tend to to get some stuff for granted, but it's it's nice to have different perspective. And so maybe Sasha, do you want to, to bring a, another input from, from that this from that topic on the actuation scheme? Um, maybe just picking up on what Dominic just said. I, I, I mean, of course, in the ideal world, that's that's completely correct. But uh, we all know that an AFM is not really ideal, and there's PSO drift and creep and all these <laughs> things. So, of course, there you have problems maybe with the set height, but you can also have a, a slight drift uh, laterally, right? And this, especially, you have it uh, when when you do larger scans. You your creep is much more relevant there. So when you retrace your topography you will most likely have a slight shift between uh, in the x axis let's say and um, again if you're on a flat perfectly flat sample uh, there's no problem but if you have uh, some surface corrugation then you will be much closer in some places and much further away in other places mm -hmm. so it's you have to really tune what you do to your sample and to your reality and sometimes also to the to the microscope that you have available because not every microscope allows uh, every mode and not um, you sometimes you don't have the right uh, extra equipment well, that's that where your instrument to. comes into play right yes, whatever a microscope you have you can always add uh, an mfli or an hf2 uh, yeah. and so this, this was this, uh, not not necessarily an argument uh, <laughs> no but but the rest was great and uh, and that's and 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 of course, depending also on the type of sample you have to measure, uh, what you want what you want to measure, it's very important uh, to. So we should not blindly follow one single type of mode, but really adapt. That's definitely okay. And so let's move to the to the third question. So, um, uh, what are the most difficult art to cope with? To cope with. So I so basically, I think from all the talks we've seen, everybody was making so be aware of this be aware of that you know things that can go wrong and stuff and there can be plenty of different type of artifact also if you do time resolve or not um, uh, but let's say maybe start let's start with the afm manufacturer so uh, when you do build your microscope for instance the dominic so what what are the maybe the part that you pay most attention to so i spend a lot of time in my phd to figure out why and KPFM signal, for example, changes when I have a, when I'm at different distances from the sample over a totally homogeneous surface. I'm taking care that I have a homogeneous tip, even, but I still observe that the closer I go, the, I get a different potential. And I was really mm -hmm. annoyed by this and I spent a long time trying to figure out where that's coming from. And the answer is, it's just actually crosstalk in your in your instrument. And I'm, when I say crosstalk, I mean that we apply a uh, modulated uh, voltage of several volts to either tip or sample. And then we want to nullify at that frequency the amplitude response or phase response or whatever we, we use. But unfortunately, the whole electronics in a, in a scan head does pick up these frequencies and you get an artificial amplitude that is not actually coming from your cantilever and that always is in your equations too. And when you turn on your KPFM controller, you're actually not offsetting exactly UDC to UCPD, but you're, you're adjusting U, 
DC such that also these additional terms fall out and, and nullify themselves. That means that you get this uh, D, the capacitance gradients, D, C, D, Z, you get that straight into your uh, measured apparent UCPD. And the only way so around Electromechanical there, coupling. Yes, or there, there is different ways of, of coupling it and can analyze it in details. Right now, for example, at Nanosurf, we spend a good amount of time figuring out where in the electronics do we actually have the crosstalk. It turns out that it's in cables, just a cable that goes to the scan mm. head. And so you really need to make a special cable that separates these lines or shields them properly. Um, and we are be... not even talking about time resolution because then if you apply even a fast pulse then it's even more complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But well, if you if you solve it cleanly in the cable, it, then then you have a lot of solved. Benjamin proposed another method where you actually compensate it uh, by applying an extra extra signal that suppresses that crosstalk. So you identify the crosstalk, and then you you suppress it. That's a, another approach to solve the problem. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so we will have Benjamin speaking as well, but maybe uh, let's uh, let's let's have Stefan answer as well. So on, on this topic, because I think you have uh, also a very good understanding of artifact. Yeah, I already mentioned the artifacts that you would see at grain boundaries, uh, just coming from from the topography. So the tip uh, effectively interacts with a larger surface area because uh, you have this curved, strongly curved surface and that uh, there you have to really be careful uh, when interpreting signals at strongly curved surfaces. Let's put it this way um, in general. Another artifact that we frequently face is, especially when we do normal tapping mode AFM, uh, depending on the surface, it's really hard to operate that in, uh, or to keep it, keep the, the AFM stable in, um, in the, in the, attractive regime or in the, uh, whether it's non really non-contact, I'm not sure, but in the, um, um, and between the attractive and the repulsive regime, you have these phase jumps. And because your, your, your sideband signal is coupled also to the carrier signal, you, you might get, if you see these phase jumps, you also get phase jumps in your KPFM signal and also mm -hmm. your, your, um, um, th that might also change the slope of your feedback signal. So that's this a phase, is... sen phase sensitive uh, detection. Exactly. Very important. Exactly. Which so, you would not have in AM, right? Uh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah, there we are. Um, we are only detecting the electrostatic force directly and not the multiplied mechanical signal with the um, electrical signal. This multiplication. So, so, so that's that's a big issue uh, that we are facing. Yeah, yeah, and so that's another argument. Sometimes why switching between mode, but the reason why FM on one hand is so good lateral, more quantitative, is also the reason why it, it's more prone to artifact uh, and is therefore more complicated to operate. And maybe Benjamin, do you do you want to comment as well or to answer what Dominic said? Well, uh, I would say that completely agree, you know, with what has been said, you know, especially concerning the capacitive cross-talk effect between, between the cables in your setup uh, on uh, external cables and sometimes, you know, inside vacuum for those of us who are working, you know, uh, in vacuum. I think this is uh, too frequently neglected, you know, probably by, by, by the community. And uh, I know that some Various, you know, routes uh, have been proposed, you know, uh, including, you know, active ca capacitive compensation. So, so far, I did not use it, but anyway, this is something we, we shall pay attention. And uh, I, I have another uh, issue, but it's, I don't know if we can really uh, say that this is an artifact, but anyway, this is somewhere, and this is an issue, you know, faced by the community. This is, uh, of course, the sensitivity of, K of KPFM to the tip changes, you know. You can have new materials for which, you know, this is not an issue to have slight tip changes to keep the topography okay. But uh, of course, the, the KPFM, you know, uh, CPD that you, that you measure is uh, dramatically sensitive to any change. And I want just to say that uh, even in the UHV, this can be the case, for, uh, especially for those of us who work, you know, on, I would say, uh, materials from the real life, you know, like uh, uh, we have seen this morning with uh, Stefan, Sasha, and me, we, we investigate solar cells. Those ones are not, you know, as a, how can I say, perfect as atomically uh, resolved surface that you can investigate, you know, with uh, ONCFM setups. 
And in that case, there is a trade-off too. Because in principle, from you know, NCFM, people expect you know, a very, very high resolution. But to achieve this, you need to be, to be very, very close to the surface. And sometimes it, in practice, it turns out that this, this is just impossible. You have to be a bit more far away from the surface you know, and to, to have a trade-off you know, between the ultimate resolution you would like to achieve and the stability of your tip that you need to, to, to preserve, you know, especially when you carry out uh, long-term measurements. Yeah, maybe I can also add on this, um, um, maybe also to what Dominic said um, about the actuation. So if you want to really be sure, it's sometimes worth to pull your own wires to the cantilever and uh, do the actuation there directly. And the other thing I wanted to mention is what I pointed out in my tutorial this morning, which is often forgotten is this DC component. So and especially in lift mode, I would expect that if any changes in the electrostatic component, if you have a soft cantilever, and usually we use this two newtons per meter, which are the compromise between um, stiffness and a high resonance frequency and uh, still getting a good signal out of them. And uh, if you have slight changes in the electrostatics and remember that equation, there was the capacity gradient in there. So any dielectric, uh, changes in the material underneath your tip can change that. The geometry might change that. And um, of course, CPD contrast and yeah, okay, the AC amplitude stays constant, but you might have also a, a slight static bending. And the closer you get to the surface in lift mode, this static bending might also cause changes in the sensitivity. So you just have to be aware of all of these uh, things um, that 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 uh, take place, and I also saw in the chat that there was a question about um, adsorbates, and this is also a very good point that I also wanted to um, uh, shout out here. So of course the surfaces need to be as defined as possible, which is sometimes tricky with the solar cell materials because. Uh, Sasha, Benjamin, you, you know that we are collaborating with uh, the material scientists and the chemists, which are basically preparing those samples to get high efficiencies and not optimizing them for uh, having clean surfaces. So um, that means that you need to, um, it's, it's ideally you have the system preparation under your own control and can transfer the samples under inert conditions that you don't have adsorbing water and stuff like that. So that, that is a big issue that you need to be aware. So I usually tell my students if the images are not nice it's 99 percent it's the it's not the fault of the afm it's the fault of the sample <laughs> yeah which doesn't make the life of researcher easier so dominic you had a, a short comment yeah so one thing that i would like to add here related to this question about adsorbates is that we often just use a metal uh, parallel capacitor plate model to write down our equations and everything is simple and or it's already complicated enough and we're, we're, we're happy with that but no one really talks about the effect of trapped charges and or for example ions that you can have in a water film and that's where I think we can still do much better work when we describe KPFM because KPFM is actually also detecting the fields from trapped charges and just the equations we write down don't make any sense if you just if you look at trap charges. So we should always add this term too. And there is still a lot of exciting science to be done like when you actually try to do KPFM in liquid. And I think Stefan, you did some of this. Just totally yeah. new field where, where we actually still can explore a lot of science. Maybe this mode uh, related to EFM in general or making an open loop measurement um, where you can also uh, map basically the charge um, because also KPFM, of course, is limited to a uh, conductive sample. Um, okay, but let's move on to, uh, to another question from the pool. So um, uh, what is the most important aspect uh, that you need for KPFM method? So let's start uh, with Sasha, where you definitely argue uh, related to time resolution, but maybe you have other arguments or... Well, um... It's a very broad question, actually, right? Yeah. So, of course, you you are interested in a lot of different things, not only time resolution. We had a, a bit of a focus this morning on time resolution, but um, there, there's much more, obviously. So, 
in principle, you, you're always um, looking at the topography because it tells you something about the, the morphology, the structure, maybe some in, in, inhomogeneities that you maybe even want to stay away from, uh, whatever. Then from the CPD image, you, you learn something about the, the electronic properties, the work function. Um, it could be related to different faces, different materials, um, um, maybe um, other things as well. Then when you put light in, you, you get a whole new uh, variable on your, on your system. So um, you, you will find out something about charge separation. You could, for example, tune even the wavelength of the light and you, you, you can maybe get information related to the band gap. Um, this tells you something about the interfaces, defects and so on. So it's, it, it can get very complicated and time resolve, of course, is one aspect where you can see something about the dynamics of these processes happening. So in the, in the end, you, you try to the best of your abilities to, to combine all of this information and, and make a hypothesis of what's going on. But uh, then, then you're limited by, by for example, uh, spatial resolution, time resolution, uh, potential resolution, as we just discussed uh, the whole morning. Um, so it, it's, it's a very complex method. And I think Dominic made a side comment, like if, if a beginner tries to do it, and, and this is something very true, you, you need to spend hours, days, weeks, months at the instrument playing with all these variables, all the buttons that you have available and really you need to develop a feeling. There's no no guidebook that you can just read and then you know how to do KPFM. You, you, it's it's an experience. And, and only when you have all of this combined um, and then nice samples from your collaborator, um, then then you can you can learn something. But it's still a lot of fun when when you then finally realize, oh, this is what's going on. Yeah, but that's why it uh, it makes a good match between science and technology because you need a bit of both to really make sure you understand and you you don't have this artifact. And by the way, so this question was the one which has the most, let's say, mitigated answers. So uh, everybody was uh, so the probably the, la the the highest lateral resolution was of first concern, but people were also interested in in CPD and, and in time resolution. So so this is more balanced. Uh, but maybe Tino, you you have also some uh, some comment on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I pretty much agree, agree with what uh, Sasha said. Just uh, that it's also important to measure, you know, the right things. And I would more or less stress on quantitative measurements okay. and not just on highest lateral resolution. Because mm -hmm. what do you gain from high resolution if what you measure is an artifact in the end? Um, so. Yeah. So and you have to order your priorities. Exactly. And to, to me, the priority is, is clearly on the quantitative measurements. And um, only when you have these, you can then derive uh, interesting physics from your measurements and correlate to models and use these models to infer maybe properties about your sample. Yeah. So and it's not just about nice images, but having a uh, nice physics. Yeah. Exactly. And I would like to mention another aspect, and that is, you know, uh, another thing that we often forget is that Kelvin proposed microscopy does not only give us a measurement of the surface potential, but we also minimize the electrostatic forces when we do the measurement. So we get a more accurate height measurement as well. And especially yep. on, on samples like graphene that are very thin, uh, a third of a nanometer, uh, it's important that you compensate electrostatics, otherwise you you measure absurd values. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Benjamin, sorry. You... I, I would like just to make, to make a, a comment that at this, at this point, you know, without being too long, you, you are completely right, you know, you need to compensate the potential to make the proper height measurement, but then also uh, beware that uh, depending on what you do, you, can, you could have artifacts, especially if you apply a too high, you know, a modulation bias, you know. Those effects, uh, Stefan, you know, uh, mentioned about the, the first component and the force and capacitive effects, you know, can be tricky, you know. So also this is a, a warning, you know, for the newcomer to the field, you know, don't imagine that, you know, by just applying, you know, a KPFM loop, you know, you, al you have solved everything, you know, with a, a topographic measurement. That, that's a very good point. And, you know, uh, some, some papers, they use modulation voltages of like five volts, seven volts. It's it's huge, <laughs> and you're, yeah, then you're completely changing what happens on the sample. So, Dominic, sorry, just so be just a short short comment on this. I 
used lift mode to actually solve that problem. And then I recorded in the lift mode, I recorded the UCPD and I played it to the tip in the topography scan line. So the same way we remember uh, the topography to do Kelvin probe, I remembered the, the UCPD to do a clean topography. And so you can, you can do that uh, iteratively yeah. and actually yeah. that helps to get a clean topography. Yeah, so that's a feed forward method. Yeah. yeah. And maybe we should uh, let Stefan also uh, comment. Ah, yeah, uh, I sorry, was also on the list. <laughs> yes, I just sorry, had to no, connect because, myself yeah. to the to the um, to the grid because my battery is running low. Um, uh, yeah, this feed forward uh, is also implemented in some commercial instruments by now. I saw that coincidentally when I looked at the signal that are applied during um, the um, KPFM operation of one of our instruments. But uh, yeah, I think um, what you, you need to be aware of uh, the limits of, uh, of your, your methods when interpreting um, your measurements. I think this is the most important message. So don't over interpret something in, in, into a two nanometer feature when your lateral resolution is 20 to 50 nanometer. So um, that's, that's maybe the most important thing. So, um, and to, to know these limits, uh, reference measurements are always um, a good way. So do look at a feature where you know um, this is that and that much, that large. Uh, look at the scan, how large is the feature, apply an external voltage look, how much of this voltage difference is, uh, is uh, picked up by your KPFM system. And thereby, you know something about uh, the, 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 the potential signal that you get out of your um, KPFM. I think that's the, the most important thing. And also for time resolution, um, look at the, the uh, look at basically rectangular uh, or at, at, at pulses and see how fast they can be tracked by your KPFM system. Yes. Thank you very much. So let's let's uh, let's handle one last question, uh, which can be maybe opening also uh, yeah for the horizon. So what are the trends that you foresee for KPFM? And uh, yeah, so I guess this is a very wide wide question wild question. Um, and let's start with Benjamin. Yeah. So uh, actually, you're completely right. This is uh, probably the widest question. And it's always difficult to uh, to answer, you know, when someone asks you to foresee something, you know, because most of the time, you know, you are wrong. <laughs> but anyway, the, the, the first thing I could see anyway is that uh, for, for some years, you know, definitely what we have seen is, uh, it, it, of, of course, some modes are emerging and some may be, you know, less used, less used, you know, for the, for the future, you know, like may, maybe the amplitude modulation. But definitely we, are, we have really seen a trend towards the multiplication of the, of, of the possible modes, you know. If you try to count, you know, what you can do now uh, beyond, you know, what, what has been said this morning, you know, I don't want to make a list, you know, but just some people demonstrated, you know, KPFM with the, with the dumping, bond excitation. You have now some new tricks to perform open loop measurements. Uh, some people, you know, uh, made the use of a full analysis of the cantilever oscillation uh, to compute the surface potential without applying a bias. And so uh, I think that uh, definitely, you know, Depending of the kind of application you target, and uh, depending of your expertise, you know the kind of uh, you know uh, device you can afford. You know there will be plenty of uh, of possibilities. And uh, the first message would be that some people uh, who are beginning, if possible, you know of course depending of your your status, your budget, where you are, should take time. Uh, definitely, you know to inform them, themselves. You know consider the, all the possibilities. You know before starting with a with a given setup. Also, also, what I of course it's difficult, you know, to make some prediction because some mode could really uh, emerge, you know, depending uh, of whether or not, you know, uh, companies uh, will will have, you know, the opportunity or the will, you know, to make them available, you know, uh, for 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 uh, for other people, you know, this, this can be the case, you know, for instance, just because I am a bit biased, you know, but for the time result measurements, you know, so mm -hmm. far, you know, it's more at, at the lab level, you know, but who knows, you know, maybe. Uh, Maybe, maybe maybe one company could decide to provide something you know uh, uh, ready to use you know for that kind of measurement even if uh, like uh, uh, you know anything we said this morning you know really people should be aware that you need an expertise you know and you need to understand what you do you know before pushing the button you know trying to get uh, 
to get uh, to get something from uh, from your experiment. And also, I would like to say to, to finish my comment is that uh, the development of, uh, of these new modes uh, really uh, in turn will benefit to the basic uh, KPFM itself. Definitely for me, this is a trend. And again, I am a bit biased, you know, by my own, you know, uh, research. But uh, for, for instance, you know, when you do time result measurements, you know, uh, some more you need to improve the resolution of your of your KPFM, uh, the basic KPFM loop, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And so by working on your time result measurement to improve the KPFM itself, you know, because you try to get a wider bandwidth, better resolution. It's, it's always an so. ongoing process. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah, but from the audience, people were also th thinking about yeah having more modes, basically coupling KPFM with, with other stuff, with other methods, uh, and so actually op optical methods are a way of of coupling KPFM, obviously. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I hope everybody could speak. Uh, so we we kept in certain order, and I think everybody had uh, had uh, you know speaking time. So let's finish now with uh, Dominic and Tino. So Dominic, maybe uh, what do you think about uh, the for the future? Um, so I totally agree with what Benjamin said. It's uh, recorded, huh? so in ten years we will tell you. Uh, okay, you can you can <laughs> double check whether we actually <laughs> launched this as product. We also got a comment for, uh, from uh, in the chat that machine learning can be a big issue. I also think this is really yeah. interesting. Maybe for KPFM, I haven't seen so much yet, but generally for AFM to use machine learning and have uh, artificial intelligence that actually self drives your AFM, I think is really a trend because only very little percentage of the whole AFM users actually care about the instrument. Many just want to, for them, it's just a microscope. They want to sit there and take an image. And we are the guys that like to turn the knobs and align lasers and we get upset if something happens automatically. But the normal user just wants to go there, press a button, get an image that says topography and surface potential and done, publish <laughs> or, or do the science. And really, None of, or, or there is a trend that in this direction, but no one has really solved this very nicely yet. It's inherently a difficult instrument to automate, but uh, I will have uh, some comments in my talk. So for you, automation and artificial intelligence can go hand in hand. They can go together, yes, yeah. because it, yeah, I think it's, it takes this experienced user, as Sasha said, to get a good result, but maybe in a few years out, we can actually have the, the and then you have less error you. due to the to the to the experimenter, I guess. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah. Also, combining modes, I think, is important. Like now, we have the KPFM community, we have the the microwave impedance community, we have the conductive AFM community. It would be great if you could just press one button and you get all those results on the same sample in the same spot. It's not yeah. easy because you need different cantilevers or so, but. Yeah, we can always dream of that. And having some cost check consistency, um, yeah. yeah. But then it goes towards big data basically, somehow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and then uh, Tino, so we started with you. Let's finish with you to wrap this up. I mean, not, not to wrap this up, but to, to finish this question, sorry. Do you yeah, have so also opinion? Of course I have opinions. Um, well, I, I pretty much agree with what uh, Dominic said. So uh, KPFM is around for how long now? Uh, 25 years? <laughs> almost. Um, it's a long time and still it takes an expert to uh, make it work. And uh, so I think we will see in the future that it will be a turnkey solution that will be more automated. Uh, and hopefully Dominic can make a contribution to that. And on the other hand, I, I also agree with combining with other techniques. That's a very important part because we, we shouldn't be focused on our on our silos, you know, at the KPFM silo. Then there's a, a silo scanning microwave and a silo scanning thermal microscopy. We need to join the forces to learn more about the samples. Um, and uh, for example, during my research, research I, I combined it with scanning thermal microscopy with colleagues at IBM. And that was a very fruitful collaboration. And I hope there will be more of that in the future. And, and to uh, some extent, that's the strength of AFM. Because if you look at also the development, so we have uh, lots of modes. And, but, and uh, so there, there is first um, 
yeah, a distribution of a lot of mode, and maybe there is a way to try to combine most of the mode or to make sense of all of these mode at once. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, then there is this trend to collect as much raw data as you can during the scan, uh, stream as much data from the from the tip, from your deflection to the hard disk and do analysis post uh, or after the measurements and learn from that, apply machine learning. And uh, because doing that, uh, basically you, you take the feedback loop out of the equation. Yeah, yeah. Some but then it's not real time anymore, is it? Or then it has to be super fast. I mean, I, you, you could even combine uh, uh, um, real-time uh, measurements of KPFM um, with offline evaluation after the fact. Uh, but then you don't need your login anymore. Things. Yeah. That makes you uh, redundant. You just need I, a large hard disk and a clever programming. I, I wouldn't say so because you need the login essentially for data reduction. You're not interested in in the full bandwidth of the uh, of what the photodiode gives you, um, but maybe you're just interested in uh, in the baseband signal of the uh, of the cantilever oscillation. So just a, a, a 10 kilohertz or 20 kilohertz bandwidth around that, and you can stream that to the hard drive and do analysis on that. Because 10 kilohertz sampling, you know, that constant continuous data streaming you will feel your hardware even you you know your gigabyte in a few minutes exactly so, uh, and this is not viable uh, you know i would say uh, yeah so it, to some extent you cannot have a, a huge bandwidth and then a huge data then it's two dimension at once i guess yeah. but, yes so um so that's uh, for the question we wanted to ask today. So we are getting close to, to the end. Um, so hopefully everybody had the feeling that they could uh, talk uh, their share. And uh, so if you have uh, just a last comment to make, um, no, I think it was good. Actually, I enjoy this time very much. Uh, I think it really shows that uh, things are never as simple as they first appear um, and that um, also at SPM, we are not there. We are not at the end yet. So there is still a lot of development and combining and joining force. Um, yeah, so yeah, I think it was great. Um, it was great having you all. Um, and uh, probably the discussion can continue a little bit in the coffee break in the afternoon. So that what uh, would make this uh, virtual event a little bit more interactive as well. Uh, so maybe Stefan, you said that you will have to, to leave at four, but uh, I hope to see you again uh, in the afternoon and engage with the audience. Mm -hmm.